Hi everybody, just taking a quick look at the uh, Magnus Carlsen Vladimir Kramnik game from the uh, Norway Chess Tournament that is going on right now. This game took place uh, yesterday and uh, we'll get right into it. Game started out D4 from Carlsen, D5, C4. E6. So we have Queen's Gambit declined. Knight of six. Carlson plays uh, exchange variation of the Queen's Gambit. Bishop G5. And uh, this is an interesting line because uh, White exerts pressure on the position, although he does allow black's bishop freedom which is usually a problem in these uh, queen's gambit uh, lines but um, what white has is a pawn preponderance in the center and also he exerts a pressure right here and there's a threat right now basically to uh, <clears throat> against this d5 pawn whereas if uh, White can keep moving. He would play bishop takes knight. And then, of course, if queen takes knight on f6, then the knight would take on d5. And um, we don't want to lose a pawn, so that would result in double pawns here. Okay, so that's why c6 is played. White has several plans in this position. One of them is to attack this structure, known as the Carlsbad structure with moves like rook to b1 and then pushing the pawn to b4 and b5 exchanging here on c6 which then causes the base of the black's pawn chain to be moved from b7 to c6 and it will look something like that and in that structure then uh, pieces would be bought on the c file for instance queen c2 uh, Perhaps the F rook would come to C1 and uh, pile up on the uh, the weakened pawn at uh, B. Uh, excuse me, C6. That's one of the plans in exchange variation. Another plan is to play F3 and then E4, utilizing this uh, extra pawn in the center. Bishop will come to d3, and then this knight would come to e2. So those are just two plans that can be played. Let's see what happened in the game. Okay, so after c6, e3 was played. Many times you will see queen c2 right away in order to take over this diagonal and prevent this bishop from uh, getting there. But e3 is playable. Bishop f5. Normal is just um, simply bishop e7. But this line is playable. I think it's, it's I mean, it's playable, but it it's kind of leads to a rough game and a lot of defending from black. But again, look who's playing the black pieces is Vladimir Kramnik, and he loves these type of positions where... Uh, you know, it's it's like a, a kind of a bad position, but he loves to defend defend these kind of stodgy positions. You know, this guy literally brought the Berlin defense, you know, in our lives. You know, <laughs> before 2000, no one was playing Berlin defense except, you know, maybe some obscure grandmaster. This guy brought, uh, and I'm a big Kramnik fan, but it's funny because he's brought some of the like dullest defenses <laughs> dullest uh defenses into the chess world you know uh to prominence basically you know defenses that have been forgotten about and uh that have bore you to death he's brought them back like the berlin defense is a big big reason why you don't see e4 played as much anymore um uh kramnik used to play at petrov <laughs> you know petrov a lot uh so Here's a here's a here's another one of those lines. So, of course, after Bishop F5, 
bishop is hanging. So the queen comes to f3. And the idea is after the bishop moves to quickly double the pawns on f6. Alright. Bishop goes back. Bishop takes f6. Queen takes f6. Queen takes f6. I think I said queen takes f6 too many times. Okay. G takes f6 now. And we see the bad pawn structure by black which is offset somewhat by the two bishops so remember that the bishop pair is very important meanwhile white has a perfect uh, pawn structure and nothing to worry about so basically this is one of those games where black tries to hold and uh, it's, this is nothing new this has been played many many times uh, matter of fact Nigel Short used to play the black side of this uh, frequently so you might want to look up some of his games in the line and just you know, get a feel for the uh, position. I usually show a couple of miniature games just to get you a feel, get you to feel what both sides are trying to do. But I'm um, pressed for time. So knight f3, just normal development. Knight d7, knight h4. Now. There's no uh, desire for our, or need for white to exchange the bishop here. What white is going for is this square, knight f5, to basically uh, block this bishop on g6 out of the game. Bishop e7, and there we go. There's the other knight, knight e2. And that knight wants to go here, g3, and block the... Uh, Bishop, this is an important square. Knight comes to b6. And what's good about this move is sometimes uh, anticipating white's plan, this knight will come back to c8 and then uh, hit uh, e6, excuse me, d6 with influence on this square. So there we go, real simple, simple idea. Bishop b4 check. King d1. I think that check is unnecessary. Maybe Kranix got a little too fancy there. I mean, we're in the end game. There's really no danger to the white king. But, um, you know, and I think that bishop winds up a little bit misplaced there. Just uh, checking like that. Um, it's hard to find a better square, but maybe instead of moving the piece twice, Maybe just maybe a move like uh, King to D7 connect connecting the rooks. You know I can't say Bishop B4 was bad, but it just seems like you know unnecessary. Okay, King D D1, but it does stop White from castling. So you know take that you know with the grain of salt. Now this move right here is considered an error. It does attack the pawn, but it's it's not a, a legitimate threat. Because tactically, it's not feasible. And of course, Magnus just ignores it. And now this bishop is blocked out of the game. So, for instance, the idea is if knight takes b2, king takes c2. Right, notice this pawn is unprotected. Knight is being attacked right here. Knight goes back. Bishop takes c4. D takes c4. And then the other rook comes in. So there's an x-ray attack on b7. Only kind of move that can be done is say like a move like c5. But then a3 happens. Bishop a5. Rook takes b7. C takes. E takes. And black's position is pretty much in uh, shambles uh, white is much better here so that's why Carlson played knight gf5 he just continued with this plan and this is why Kramnik did not did not take instead he connected his rooks played king d7 okay all is not lost now rook b1 comes into effect King e6, 
Kramnik just centralizes the king a little bit more and puts some pressure on these this piece right here on f5. He's like, hey, I want you to get out of there. So, bishop d3. Because Carlson is there to stay. Rook hc8. And to me, I think Kramnik started panicking a little bit and running out of ideas because Rook c8 really doesn't do anything. I mean, the idea to play c5 is dubious in this position because he's taking on extra pawn weakness without... Because after c5, this pawn will become isolated. And he's ta he's already has a bunch of busted pawns over here. So taking on this extra weakness without any compensating attack uh, is, is definitely bad. So I think Kramnik had lost the thread of the position by now. Um, what he what he should have did and what some of the analysts said is he should have just uh, realized that he was wrong with his initial idea and retreat, retreated the knight back. Um, and if he had to move a rook, rook g8 is okay because at least he's on a semi-open file one day when this bishop moves. But to move these pawns at this point, that's a no. Okay, so rook hc8 was played. Carlson connects his rooks, which is important. King e2. The bishop goes back to f8. And again, uh, short of, uh, Kramnik's running short of an ideas. g4. Now the idea here with g4 is nice because you see the bishop's in a bad spot. So the idea with g4 is simply to drop this knight back to g2 and then bring it here. You check and then also play the move h4 and h5 trapping the bishop or forcing a favorable exchange. Because if you notice, this is another knock on uh, rook hc8. Is now these guys are lined up together. So if this bishop's forced to exchange, this bishop will come here, f5 would check, and win the exchange. So Carlson's position is just flowing. Kramnik goes with this, this dubious idea, c5. And uh, Carlson just ignores it. Plays, goes on with his plan. And notice the threat also of knight f4 check. And notice the king. The king's safety is a little suspect. So if this knight comes to f4 with check, there's only one square for the king to go, and that's to d7. Now look at that, and look at the knight that's badly placed on a4, right? That means you get this situation. The bishop will come here with check. So that's the threat also. It's check, knight f4 check, king d7, and bishop b5. Okay, so Kramnik takes. And there's an isolated pawn that I told you about. So black just picks up. Black just picks up another weakness, basically. Without any compensation. Usually if you take on isolated pawns and things like that, you want to have like dynamic piece placement. Uh, you want to be real active, attacking, and have some type of initiative or leading development. Black has none of those things and therefore is probably busted at this point. He just has the weakness without the benefits. Like in chess, you always got to have some kind of, if you have any a weakness, a bad pawn structure or something like that, you have to have something to counterbalance that or you'll just be lost. You can't take on a bad pawn structure and not be active. Okay, so C takes, bishop comes to D6. is h4 and let me just say that the bishop came to d6 to prevent the knight from coming to f4 but there's the other plan h4 now the bishop is threatened with the same threat I spoke about before after bishop takes f5 then the other bishop the white bishop will capture on the f5 and then the rook is in trouble h5 was played 
And at this point, Kramnik's uh, pretty much lost. Knight g7. And material is going to just start dropping. And that's what happens here. Kramnik just loses a pawn. Bishop d3. But these pawns are doubled. And Kramnik has a glim glimmer of hope that he probably can stop them or, or win them somehow. King comes to d7. Just getting off the open file. Knight comes to e3. He can't go to he can't go here, so Carlson modifies his plan. And he conveniently attacks the weakened pawn on d5. As well as have access to f5. So the knights are dominating in this position. Knight b6. Protecting the pawn. And looking at this square and some variations. And these pawns are so weak, Magnus is just having a field day. Knight g4, attacking that f6 pawn. Okay, now the rook comes back because not only was Magnus attacking this pawn, but he's threatening the, just to push also. So Magnus doesn't even bother to capture this pawn. He could he could have captured the pawn there too. He could have. There's a lot of wins here. He could have played h6. Instead, he just um, plays rook hc1, just dominates the position. Again, utilizing the f4 square, double attack on the bishop. Bishop d8, breaking the coordination between the rooks. There it is, h6. Rook c8, b3. Again, unnecessary, but there's as many winning winning moves here. But B3s is great. It just stops any nonsense pieces coming uh, coming onto the uh, uh, C file and uh, shuts down any counterplay. Rook C6, Knight G3. Of course, the simple rook bc1 trading off rooks could have been played. Knight g3. Bishop c7. There it is. Rook bc1. Trading down to a completely winning situation. Some desperado situations going on here with bishop f4. And the rook lined up on the pawn. Now this pawn is threatened by two pieces. Kramnik defends. Let's check. Knight g4 again threatening this. Knight d7 attacking. Rook. Bounce back to c2. Again, des desperation taking place. King e6. Knight goes back. King goes back. Rook e2. And the rest of the game. The brutality can just be observed at this point but uh white is just up so much material and there's no stopping this pawn uh, black will have to give up this knight and um reason why i call some play h5 here is just to keep the knight from going here so for instance if uh if h7, he might try to hang on with a move like that. I mean, he still lost, but, you know, and then go back there or something like that. So, Carlson just drives, you know, just drives it home. And then this is a nice tactic, you know, just forking the king and queen. Forces the knight to capture. And Kramnik is just playing on adrenaline right now. h7. Check. 
and then Kramnik resigned. So that was just a brutal game um, by uh, by Kramnik. He made made a uh, mistake. It seemed like he wasn't prepared to go into that because that's not the normal uh, Kramnik we see. It, we usually see him playing in the black side of Berlin defense. Uh, you don't really see guys playing a, a Queens pawn opening against him too much. Um, and maybe perhaps too he might have thought Carlson was going to play you know something innocuous against him because a lot of times Carlson to stay away from main lines you know and play stuff like uh, you know uh, knight f3 g3 bishop g2 or something like that or or d4 and followed by bishop f4 but we see Carlson you know he's probably preparing for that championship match and he's playing main lines he played a queen's gambit declined exchange variation no frills um, sharp as ever and it seemed like he caught Kramnik off guard and uh, once Kramnik uh, kind of lost the idea you know lost the threat of the position that was it he went down in a hurry so even though this game lasted 50 moves it was it was over way before then so hope you enjoyed that like subscribe to my channel I appreciate the support uh, check out my miniature videos if you're interested in learning openings. I'm telling you that uh, short miniature games are the best way to learn tactics in the openings. You'll find yourself just knowing the just knowing the opening without little effort just by watching the watching the videos. You know, re let, letting them uh, putting them on repeat. Just just watching them, watching the miniatures. Right now, I have uh, miniature series in the Scandinavian and uh, in the Pyrrhic. I'm getting ready to do, uh, getting ready to start the Alicon, uh defense miniatures, and these miniatures are for both black and white. So it doesn't matter what side that you prefer. You might be a, a player of the black pieces with the Alicon. Same thing. It's gonna help your opening and chess, your understanding in general, and your chess understanding. So, uh, like I said, like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.